I have to tell you a little bit about what happened to me over the weekend. And a man needs to know his limitations, and that's part of humility. And, and I failed in that regard in some ways, that a man needs to know his limitations. Now, uh, earlier, I started out on a, uh, was it Sunday? It was Sunday. I had the Sunday service, and I set up till 3 o'clock, Sunday night, 3.30 actually. Saturday. Well, it was Sunday morning. And then Sunday morning, I got up and came to church. And what happened was um, I suffered from um, uh, all the classic symptoms of a heart attack. And it was. And I've had this happen before to me. And I, I have a, a heart disease. A, a part of it is the heart disease. And uh, doctors... Now, you have to get on doctors, by the way. Sometimes they won't listen to you, and you have to jump on them and say, uh, let's get with it. Uh, you know, tell me what's going on. Get me, you know, do some type of test, but they won't unless you jump on them about it. And uh, thank God, uh, by the grace of God, I, I, I work in the medical field. And by the grace of God, I do, because in the medical field, I know some of this terminology. So I can look at the doctor, and I can say, look, I type uh, some of the notes that uh, doctors type, and uh, and therefore uh, it's okay if you're nervous. <laughs> but I type some of the notes that you type, and uh, I understand that uh, the doctors today they go through a lot of study and uh, eight years in college and eight years of all of that that they have to go through to know the things that they know, and they do know a lot. But a lot of times, not in all cases, but in some cases, they get an arrogant attitude about themselves because they think, I know all of these things, and they do. And I understand why they get that type of attitude. And they get that attitude because there are people who are always down on doctors because of, uh, well, they say, well, you just want my money, and you're doing this to do this, and you're doing that to do that. So doctors uh, receive just as about as much criticism as a pastor does. And uh, that's the way it goes. And so when it comes to care, because of people's old sin natures, people don't get the care that they need. But I'm going to get the care that I need, and I'm going to go to a doctor, and everything's going to be fine, and I'm going to be up here teaching. And if I uh, drop dead in the pulpit, good. <laughs> you will learn something. You will say, the Word of God is the most important thing in your life. And if I were to just fall over, go listen to the Colonel. Listen to the Colonel tapes, and you will learn the Word of God. And this has been the happiest I can tell you right now. I'm going to get a little personal with you because I'm being a bit sentimental. That's what happens when you get close to death. You get a bit <laughs> sentimental. And so I'm going to tell you, uh, as sentimental, this has been by far the happiest time in my life, and in fact, I'm doing something that I enjoy up here, and, I, and I'm sorry, I enjoy it very much, and, uh, and uh, uh, all right, let's continue with the Word of God, <laughs> all right, and uh, on Sunday, by the way, Sunday morning, uh, I got out of church Sunday, and my parents looked at me, <laughs> my parents looked at me, and they go, what in the world? <laughs> They didn't know what I was teaching. Well, they knew what I was teaching, but they thought uh, they saw something that uh, maybe something was wrong with me. So they looked at me and they said, "What? What was all that about that Sunday?" And um, and I wasn't drunk. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I'm not drunk now either. It's just the fact that uh, when you have these health problems, it, it, it causes things to happen in the brain, and uh, the fact that the blood's not flowing as it should, and I'll get that checked out is the fact that uh, since the blood's not flowing like it should, I feel a bit weird, a little lightheaded, a little strange. So if I fall out, well, okay, just call the ambulance. <laughs> but I'm up here uh, tonight, and I do feel a little lightheaded. But, but it's uh, the Word of God that I need to be teaching. And in teaching 
the Word of God. I'm, I'm here tonight. I shouldn't be. I might, maybe I should be sleeping. But I'm going to be here, and I'm going to teach it, and I'm going to come back Thursday night at 7 o'clock. And let's take some points now. If I just rely on the notes that I've taken instead of trying to go off the top of my head, I might be all right. And let me say uh, once again, I am not drunk. <laughs> Some people, well, some people get weird ideas, and I know they could, but it's not. It's a health issue, and I don't, I wouldn't come to church drunk. That's stupid. There's no way. So let's take a look on the board up here. Look at that. <laughs> I'm not complaining. I don't mind about the blindness. You do go blind though if you stare at that long enough. Could die in a car accident. Immediately, with no pain involved, just an immediate death, or they could die in their sleep. Either way, it's still God's victory. So the principle is we can never really uh, judge, and we never should judge, especially someone's death, because we just do not know they're in glory forever and ever. And it's none of our business whether someone has died a winner or a loser. We have enough uh, difficulty living our own spiritual lives. So the manner of our physical death is determined by the wisdom of God. And that is why we as believers should not mourn as those who have no hope. And that's, of course, found in Scripture. And sometimes death, uh, some of the most horrible uh, experiences for families to go through is an accidental death, something that's shocking and not even... Uh, they weren't even thinking about it. Someone who has been very ill for the past three years and they pass away, well, you've probably been preparing yourself. But someone who you very healthy, very strong, very handsome, very beautiful, suddenly dies on you and it's accidental, a lot of times people like to, that is when people really lose it and say, uh, why did God let this happen? And, and it doesn't matter how accidental it might appear or it, and it doesn't matter if it seems that someone was negligent or at fault. I remember uh, at Baraka Church one time, a little girl named Valerie, I think she was about seven, eight, or nine, somewhere in there, six. Well, she had believed in Christ, and there's a little pamphlet on it. I don't know if we have it over there. We should. It's called Valerie's Victory, and it tells all about it. And she was out in the uh, parking lot of Baraka Church, and uh, somebody uh, backed up their car and ran over, and she died. And, and uh, the family handled it very well, and it's all in that pamphlet. And there was no blame, and there was no, why didn't you look behind you? And there was no, uh, we're going to sue you, you were negligent. There was none of that, because they had determined that, well, this was an accidental thing, and it was God's timing, and God's timing is perfect. And they didn't fall apart. And they uh, didn't fall apart because they knew that their little girl was in heaven, even though it was accidental, even though it uh, ripped their world apart. And But they still used doctrine in the situation and did not lash out, did not uh, blame anyone and sh that they should be negligent or at fault. And that's because the death of anyone is God's timing. It was God's timing for that little girl named Valerie. And it's God's timing for us, whether it be an accident or whether it be a prolonged thing in which we know we have cancer and we're dying or heart disease or something else. And it, it doesn't really matter because it's all wrapped up in God's wisdom. So we have no right whatsoever to be bitter. We have no right to be vindictive. Sometimes when people die, they want to blame somebody. If they don't blame God, they blame somebody else. A lot of times they just blame God. God, why did you let this happen? But in something like a car accident, they want to blame somebody else. And especially in cases where it was a, a, a drunk driving accident or something like that, and they really want to blame the drunk driver, and uh, he is culpable under the law and should face the tremendous penalties that the law has for him. But for the person who's gone through it, they should not be bitter.
toward that man. He's going to be punished under the law or the woman, whoever has uh, had the drunk driving incident, and that occurs a lot. And what happens is uh, people get so shattered by that and they blame that one person their whole life and they have hatred for that one drunk person their whole life. And that person might not be too bad a fellow. He just made a... Uh, a bad decision in air, a bad decision in judgment one night, and they came home from a club or something else, and uh, it ended up in a car accident, and somebody died, and then he gets up for uh, I don't know what they call it. I'm sure Brad does, but uh, it's uh, reckless, homicide. reckless homicide, and they can spend years and years and years and years in jail, and they're going to pay for it, and they deserve it, and they they deserve it because they should have used their head. But that doesn't give the right of the victim to be bitter. And you should never be bitter because bitterness takes you out of fellowship. Even in murder cases, bitterness will take you out of fellowship. And in murder cases, the law should deal with the murderer and the murderer should be executed. And it doesn't happen often under our law, although it should and it did in the past. But still, we have no right to be uh, bitter and we have no right to start a vigilante or vigilante type movement in which we uh, send somebody, for example, somebody kills our child and we get all up in arms and say, well, I'm going to kill that uh, SOB. And you go in the courtroom with a gun and kill him. Well, that's vigilante and now you're guilty of murder and now you're going to jail. And you've solved nothing. And you have no right to be bitter because if the law doesn't handle that uh, murderer let me tell you something. You leave it in the hands of the Lord and He'll handle them. And He'll make sure He handles them because as our Lord said, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And God the Father will make sure that uh, judgment will come. And we always have to remember, revenge is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. And we should never try to have revenge against somebody or have payback. And don't you worry about it. And the same applies in death, that we should not become bitter. Not when we're dying or not when anyone of our loved one dies. We should never become bitter. And we should never judge a fellow believer who has passed on because it is not subject to either judging or speculation once he goes on to be with the Lord. And you say, well, why? Because it's God's victory. If he, if he or she is a believer, it's God's victory, and uh, the old things have passed away, and it's not up for us to speculate about. Also, we can claim a promise, Romans eight thirty-eight through 39. And you can turn there if you wish. Romans eight thirty-eight through 39. Now, we're studying death and resurrection because this is what our Lord Jesus Christ just went through. He went through physical death, and then he went through a resurrection. We, too, if the resurrection doesn't occur in this generation, will go through physical death, and then we will go through resurrection. And we will follow the exact pattern of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in Romans eight thirty-eight through 39, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So death does not separate us from the love of God. For I am persuaded that neither death, and when we die, we're still under the love of God as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So our soul simply leaves our body and goes to heaven. What's there to be scared of? You scared of pain? Well, uh, your body can only take so much pain. And I can understand not wanting to go through pain, but uh, so what? You can utilize the spiritual life going through pain. But death? What's there to be scared of? Your body, uh, your soul will simply leave your body and you go into the presence of the Lord. And uh, even though your body goes to sleep, you don't. And even when you're sleeping, your soul's still awake. We know that because we have dreams and all sorts of things. And so the body goes to sleep and we go to heaven. And that's what that is the analogy of going to going to sleep. 
And death does not separate us from the love of God. In fact, this is an eternal security verse. Nothing can separate us from the love of God when we believe in Jesus Christ. Death can't. Angels can't. Principalities and powers deals with uh, the satanic principalities and powers. Deals with Satan and his demon armies. They can't even separate us from the love of God, even if we follow in their cosmic system. Even if we screw up and follow Satan's cosmic system, that power cannot separate us from the love of God if we believed in Christ. Nor things present, nothing going on right now, can separate us from the love of God. Nor things to come. Whatever's going to happen in the future, whether it be good or bad, it's not going to separate us from the love of God. Nor height nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Any other creature includes ourselves. We cannot separate ourselves from the love of God. When we believe in Jesus Christ, we receive phileo in the Greek. That's God's personal love. And therefore, we cannot lose our salvation and death cannot even separate us from the love of God. Psalms. 116.15 says this. Psalms 116.15 Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. Who is a saint? Do you have to be good to be a saint? No. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you become a saint. 1 Peter 2.5 and 1 Peter 2.9 makes it very clear that we're part of the royal family of God. And we are saints. So every time you read in the Bible where it says saints, well, it's talking about anyone who's believed in Jesus Christ. And David was a saint. And you sitting here today, even though we're not stupid and we don't run around calling ourselves saints, we're saints. I'm St. Andrew. Hello, how are you? And you are saints, everybody else. And we're all saints. And precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints, winner or loser. There's no distinction. And you could be a loser as a saint. You could be a loser saint. So what? Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of His saints. In other words, death is part of living. Life and death, actually, the Apostle Paul makes really no distinction between it except this. For me, and this is an elative conclusion, meaning there's no verb he became very, well, actually, this is elliptical. It's not the elliptic conclusion. This is elliptical, meaning he's uh, taken out the verb. And the verb is put in there in the English so we can understand it. But uh, uh, when he takes out the verb, it comes out like this. For me, living Christ, dying prophet. And that's how it comes out in the Greek. And, of course, we have, for me, living as Christ and dying as prophet. That smooths it out a bit. But, uh, for example, if uh, your mother tells you, uh, Jimmy, go to the store. Or, uh, or, or uh, let's see, how should it go? Uh, Jimmy, you should go to the store. And then uh, you're sitting there watching TV and you don't listen. And, and so, after a while, she gets uh, a little upset with you. Jimmy, go to the store. And then after that... Uh, finally, it just gets elliptical, and she finally says, To the store! And then you hop up from the TV and go to the store, like you were told to. And this is the Apostle Paul getting elliptical. For me, living Christ and dying prophet. That is how every mature believer should look at death. And actually, I would like that on my gravestone if I have one. I'm going to be cremated. But uh, whatever, whatever they put my ashes, ashes in, I want this phrase there. For me, living Christ and dying prophet. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study resurrection and the physical death of the believer so that we might come to understand that there is nothing to fear when it comes to death, and that we should understand that when we live our unique spiritual lives, that living is Christ and dying is profit. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.